and that is that. So with that being said, let me uh, kick off today's webinar. As I said earlier, my name is Alan Schemmel. I am the Editor-in-Chief of DevOps.com. And today's webinar is brought to us by Electric Cloud. If we could go to our next slide. Okay, today's speakers are Amy DeMartin, a senior analyst with Forrester. And I've been lucky enough to see Amy present multiple times now, and it's always a pleasure. She brings some great insight and analysis to it, and I'm sure she will today. Amy, I just double checking sound, making sure you're there. I'm here. Hello. Okay, hi, Amy. And our second speaker today is Wesley Pollan, GM and VP of Deployment Solutions for Electric Cloud. Wesley, nice to have you on board today, just making sure you can hear us and we could hear you. Yes, I can. Alan, thanks for having me. Thank you, and, and thanks for joining us today. Okay, with that, I wanted to uh, turn things over to Amy. And um, actually, Amy, I think we're going to do some polling questions with the hand over to you, correct? That sounds great. Okay. So you know what? Let's, uh, let's, let's get our polling questions up here. And I'll ask one of our Jules Engineering on the background if we can pop a polling question. Our first question is, hmm, what is the time frame in which you plan to implement the following? Oh, actually, I think we probably should have done a slide first. So Jules, I'm going to ask you to pull this one back for just a moment. I apologize. And instead, let's let's hand it over to Amy. And Amy, if you would like to ask the polling questions at, at the appropriate time, it would be great. Awesome. Well, you know what? I think I'll let Wesley do them, and I'll just go through my content for the, first, and then I'm sure Wesley will be able to introduce them before he launches as oh, well. Oh, okay. Fine. So, my, my fault, right. misreading it. No, no worries. Okay. Just also quickly. For those of us listening, or you may be following along with friends on Twitter, you can join in the fun and the questions, hashtag EC webinar, that's Elephant Charlie webinar on Twitter, if you'd like to uh, join in the conversation there. Okay, Amy, promise not to interrupt you again. No worries. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Alan, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Today, we're going to be talking about where's the heat? We're going to be talking about top DevOps use cases in this coming year, 2016. I wanted to level set and just provide a definition that we here at Forrester use for what DevOps really is. Um, just so that everybody's on the same page, Forrester believes that DevOps is really a set of practices and cultural changes fundamentally um, that is supported by complementary tools. And what the goal is is to automate the software delivery pipeline. And the whole purpose of this automation of the software delivery pipeline is to enable organizations to better win, serve, and retain their customers better and faster than we have ever before. So the goal is continuous delivery. So I'm going to take a little bit of time and do a short history lesson, um, kind of where we've been and where we're going. So the top really shows traditional service delivery. And I know I have committed this in, in the past as well, where you take you know, a year and a half to two years to make a release, you craft it. Um, you know, customers just have to wait for you to make a release. Um, you get to determine your time scale. And you, know, you plod through the different stages of the life cycle, and things kind of get thrown over the wall at each phase. So information gets lost as you go through. Thankfully, the modern service delivery life cycle changes that entirely. And basically, you take the big monolithic releases, and you break them up into smaller and smaller pieces. That's what agile methodologies have done on the development side of the house. The problem is if you just do Agile, you have smaller and smaller releases, and development basically makes code faster, but it sits on the shelf. So 
actually that's when infrastructure and operations, I often refer to them as INO, infrastructure and operations folks need to get involved to really complete that agile transformation, that nimbleness on the back end, or um, completing the continuous delivery life cycle. So developers often will start automating builds, uh, some basic testing that they have to do might make a journey or foray into overall testing, but then really it's left to the infrastructure and operations people to pick it up from there um, or even earlier in the life cycle and make sure that releases are consistent for every application we release and fast, of course. And there's this collaboration between development and operations and other folks across the organization. Security, for example, uh, enterprise architects, all of everyone keeps banding together to make the success of this product even better than it was before. And with this collaboration, you get feedback loops. So you stop losing all the information that you had in the previous life cycle where it was kind of thrown over the wall. Requirements, for example, move forward. When you make consistent environments between development, test, and production, INO folks are actually involved at the very beginning. So that they know when an application is going to have a spike of capacity during certain months or possibly an increase overall of usage because of new features that are planned. So that is really kind of an upfront thing. INO folks are now involved all the way from requirements all the way through to production to really make sure that this continuous delivery pipeline is a reality and runs smoothly. One of the big use cases we're seeing pop up in 2016 is this whole idea of governance. So yeah, okay, this idea of moving fast is great, being able to better serve our customers even better, but how do you do that with safety? And so a lot of folks either say, mm, this DevOps thing feels very unsafe, or I'm in a highly regulated industry, I can't possibly participate um, in this DevOps thing because of governance. And so we have this sort of upside down triangle when we talk about governance. Governance really applying to all companies. It's the ability to control releases as they walk out the door. And it really starts with, like I said, all the way from development through to production. And that one of the benefits of the continuous delivery pipeline is because you're using technology through it all, all of these tools are creating log files, which automatically creates an audit trail for those of us who are concerned with governance. Also, if you use a technology stack that is standard across a, a single application and then apply it to multiple, then you have the ability to start looking at governance across several different applications, hopefully all. Hopefully you use that same technology stack across all your applications. Now then there's the next level, which is compliance. So the, for those folks who are um, in a specific industry, maybe you have to conform to PCI, for example. Um, depends on your industry, they're predefined, and you have to comply to a certain set of standards. Now that first step, you gotta have governance. Second then, okay, how do I produce the right artifacts to show that I am compliant to these different um, uh, regulatory so standards. So the last one is then if you actually get audited. Um, so in compliance, you're ready. You're ready to show that you are compliant with PCI. Um, audit actually means you have to hand over these and you are actually getting judged by your ability to hand them over um, and have the right set of things, which is a smaller set of folks than people who are concerned with compliance. So what makes, um, so prior to DevOps, when we looked at governance, you know, it looked like segregation of duties, where there was a, a definite handoff between developers to operations and even segments inside development and inside of operations. Um, there were lots of manual testing and or CAB reviews. CAB being that review that's usually near the end of the release where a bunch of people sit in a room and say, yep, that the testing results look okay. Yeah, we think this change is gonna work with everything else that's going on. We think it's all right, it can go ahead. Um, and that is also a form of manual approvals, but there's also manual approvals going on, separate from the cab, um, could be interspersed throughout the entire release. And then finally, there's code reviews where it's like, okay, you know, let's do these code reviews in the development, but oftentimes the results of those code reviews were then lost as it went through the rest of the life cycle. But 
good governance is actually something a little bit different. Um, the first thing is, is it's completely inclusive. It's inclusive of all applications of the full delivery life cycle. It's also sustainable, and that's where that whole the delivery pipeline is automated, is it helps with the sustainability because it's not a manual process. You're not manually trying to pull data. You're not manually, manually trying to create data. It is actually automatically created for you. Um, another another uh, key role of good governance is, is that it's consistent. You are applying it consistently across the life cycle and across several different applications. What you are doing in one application is the same as you're doing in another. And the, the next thing is, is it's transparent. So, you know, what you're pulling, how you're pulling it, anyone can look at, anyone can see, everybody knows what's happening, what's being used, and what data is being collected. And, and it really is all four things, um, all four components really make governance constant. Um, so that you're constantly applying excellent governance across, like I said, the delivery pipeline, across all applications. So now let's move on to industries. So certainly governance is one of those hot topics, but let's talk about who's doing what. At Forrester, we actually divided up this heat map into three different application types. PC applications are at the top, e-commerce websites, which is circled, and then mobile applications on the bottom. And we divided it then by the different industries. So let's first talk about e-commerce websites. That is the hottest segment of 2016. And what we're seeing is it, actually mobile apps was the hottest last year. This year, we kind of doubled down on e-commerce websites. So when I pulled this data in November, we really weren't surprised when we saw that actually e-commerce websites beat brick and mortar for the first time um, on Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So really folks are focusing on their ability to communicate with customers and really focusing on that almost retail space um, where folks are really interacting with companies to buy things or change their forms, submit forms on their behalf. Um, those kinds of websites are really hot. The next level of hot really focuses on mobile apps. So coming is no surprise to anyone, mobile applications are another great way to interact with your customers. And in fact, some applications really only have a mobile application and not an e-commerce website. Those took kind of a backstage to the e-commerce websites, but not by much. So we're still seeing a lot of heat around mobile apps, and we expect that to continue. So let's now dive into the industries that are hot. So two sets of applications, e-commerce, mobile apps, great. PC applications, it's worth noting, is not actually that far behind e-commerce or mobile apps. PC applications can include things like SaaS applications, stuff like Salesforce. Um, those really sit at that top level. But when we start looking at industry-wide, who is the hottest? The hottest is actually services. Now, what's wrapped up into services is folks like advertising, marketing firms, people who have a hard time differentiating, differentiating their services from others in their competitive field. But it also includes those companies that actually make e-commerce websites and mobile applications for other companies. So that, thus the form of the heat in services. Now oddly enough, the next level of heat comes from this segment marked Other Manufacturing and Pharma. And I get lots of questions about what is this and what's underneath it. So there's your normal candidates that you might expect, food manufacturing and apparel manufacturing and paper manufacturing sit under here. But I think the real source of heat from underneath here comes from folks like aerospace and defense manufacturing, uh, medical equipment and supplies, and even pharmaceutical and medicine manufacturing themselves are actually generating the heat in this segment. And then when we look to the other industries, um, of course, financial services um, have been uh, making a lot of noise. They actually spend the most out of all the industries on infrastructure and operations. And so there's, it's not a big surprise that they show up. But financial services also includes folks like insurance companies. So they are um, you know, the, the third level of heat. Then the fourth level of heat comes from high-tech manufacturing. 
Now, this includes pure software product, software companies, so that should come as no surprise that that one is the fourth. All right. Oops. Not sure if I can go forward. Here we go. Um, so where's the heat? Where's the change? Um, we generally at Forrester, when a new data comes out, we replace the old data. Um, and we don't really show it again. But I thought for this conversation it might be interesting to show the old versus the new um, so that you guys could kind of get a feel for the changes in the industry and across the different industries. And I think the first thing that you probably notice is how much more heat there is in 2016 than there was in the previous heat map. Um, also in the previous heat map, uh, the media, entertainment, and leisure, the e-commerce website, and PC applications were actually white, along with transportation mobile apps. And white meant completely nascent. We did not get any data from those areas that was statistically significant. So that means there was virtually no DevOps movement in that space. Now, if you look at the current heat map, you'll see that there is no nascent uh, industries and application type pairs. There is heat everywhere. So that's the first change I'd like to point out. Um, we already talked about the fact that mobile apps actually led last year, but this year it's actually e-commerce websites. But then there's some interesting heat coming from uh, things like uh, the water, waste, and telecom segments. Um, also heat coming from um, healthcare is actually heating up. And I, um, you know, when you think about mobile apps, for example, um, you know, there's a big consolidation in healthcare these days, so probably not a, a big need for healthcare apps, um, unless it's to do with the insurance companies. Um, and then those move more into financial services. But actually, the heat is coming up for healthcare companies, um, you know, being able to submit forms, um, being able to interact with uh, healthcare providers is actually heating up. And then the last one I wanted to cover was actually government and education. So that's actually in the new graphic, the second from the end um, is actually heating up. And really that, that also has to do with, um, you know, charity organizations also sit in there, education also sits in there, so universities. And what we're seeing is the government really speaking up and saying, hey, this is something that we're interested in so that we can develop, develop applications faster along with the other industries. Okay, so that's the heat map, um, and so what's next? Where do we see heat coming from in the future? So one of the things that we do not yet cover is the Internet of Things. So that is, of course, a separate application type that we can track. Um, we do track with its own separate heat map. And so I've included the IoT heat map because I thought it might be interesting to show some overlap between the two. Um, they've broken it down into even more industries than we do with the DevOps heat map. So you'll see it broken down slightly differently. And they also have several different uh, types of, um, you know, they don't break it down by application, they break it down by use case. And what you're gonna see is a lot of use cases that optimize assets. But actually, the promise of the Internet of Things is to differentiate your products and services as kind of that next level above optimized assets. And then above that is actually to completely differentiate your customer experience, make something totally new and unique. And so we really feel at Forrester that the next application, the next wave of DevOps, will actually be coming from these Internet of Things um, applications. And so when we look at it, we're really looking at uh, software applications or smart devices that will have a software component and being able to quickly deliver new functionality, maybe security patches, maybe updates. And, and we really feel like Internet of Things is a great target. And I just want to mention a few things before I hand it over to Wesley. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was, um, you know, Wired Magazine put out an article about 
a car being hacked. So it's very important for cars, for example, to be much more like the Tesla that can accept software application updates very quickly, especially as we move into self-driving cars. Another example um, is medical devices. They actually um, turned off the um, heart pumps for some of the politicians because they were afraid they might actually get hacked. Um, and they were fearful that that could be a way that um, a malicious attacker could actually attack people. Um, and so it's these things where it's, it involves human health and safety that we really feel like DevOps is going to sing in the IoT space because it's going to allow companies to release very quickly in emergency cases, like maybe you find a security defect or like I said, getting out new features and functionality to customers, making them happy, um, and or just plain product defects. Um, one more instance I wanted to cover was Nest. I don't know if any of you were affected, um, but in January, Nest went down actually on a very cold night. Uh, he turned off for many people. So once again, the ability to release very quickly in this IoT space we think is going to be very hot in this year and then in coming years. And I think that's it. So then, Wesley, I will hand it off to you. Okay. <clears throat> Wesley, you there, I hope? Absolutely. Yeah, we... And I was about to say that. Uh, good, good time for a polling questionnaire. Absolutely. So now, hopefully, our polling questions make a little, uh, a little more sense. So first question is, what is the time frame in which you plan to implement the following initiative? DevOps initiative, and you can see the answers there, short-term, long-term, mid-term, never. So just take a moment for our audience to answer this. It shouldn't uh, have too much thought, I hope. And we'll uh, close voting in five, four, three, two, one. And our survey results show, wow. That's good if you're a big DevOps fan, I guess, right? 41% short term, zero to six months. 31% seven to 12 months. So Wesley, one could look at that and say, look, fully 72% of the audience are going to implement a DevOps initiative within the next year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pretty, pretty high. But, I, I, you know, we do these polls all the time, and... Uh, it's not that out of line with what we see. I, I think we are we're seeing that. Let's jump to our next question, guys. And that is what is the time frame in which you plan to implement the following initiatives? We're talking now about deployment and application release automation. So it could be deployment release automation, and in some other cases it may just call it application release automation. And again, same kind of time frames, kind of short term, mid medium term, longer term, or not at all. And if you'd be kind enough to vote, we'll close voting off in um, five, four, three, two, one. And Jules, our results show. Again, pretty consistent here, Wesley. We actually even stronger. We have zero to six months at 54%, seven to 12 months at 29%. And, uh, you know, or taken together, geez, that's about almost 80, over 80 percent, 83 percent within the next right. year. And only 6 percent with no plans. Um, pretty, pretty, uh, it's pretty eye-opening, actually, when you think about it. Um, you know, armed with that information, De Wesley, why don't you take over? All right. So, Jules, let me just double check if you've made me presenter so I can navigate the actual screens. That would be great. And uh, I'll let you know when I have that, and then I will go okay. ahead and begin. All right. While, while we're waiting on that, just a quick reminder, especially we've had people arrive after we started, the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, usually in the right-hand corner of your screen, any questions based upon what Amy was presenting or what Wesley's presenting, please feel free, write them in in real time, and we will get to them at the conclusion of today's presentations. So don't don't wait. You may forget. Put your questions in. Wesley, you've got this? Yes, I do. Okay. So it looks yeah. like uh, you made me presenter, Jules. So hopefully you can see my screen. 
And if you can, we will go ahead and begin. So thanks, everybody. Um, again, my name is Wesley Pullen. I'm General Manager and Vice President here at Electric Cloud over our Deployment Solutions Business Unit. And the interesting thing is Amy did a phenomenal job of laying the groundwork. She defined DevOps, showed us some heat. And now what I would like to do is kind of drill down, peel the onion back just a tad bit and get into some of the more specific use cases we're seeing. It'll map to one of the diagrams Amy showed on IoT where the specific use cases were on the left-hand side and then they enforced or took the liberty to show the heat in that area. I'm going to do a very similar exercise that'll kind of coincide very nicely with what uh, Amy Amy just showed. But in order to make sure we're all on the same page, instead of just words, I wanted to show a diagram that helps submit kind of where some of these technologies are. You had some questions on DevOps and, and some information on application release automation or just release automation or configuration management. It's helpful to kind of understand the zones that they sit in. So when I look at Dev and we look at Ops, and we look at applications, their configuration and infrastructure, you can see kind of, you know, as you go from left to right that, you know, you have software development teams working, they have tools, and sometimes these areas can be very, very siloed. The objective here from a DevOps orchestration pipeline and feedback that Amy was showing in her diagram, just another way of drawing it out is all of this should be interconnected so that when I execute a build, when a developer makes a commit, all the way through to it being operated and monitored in a production setting, it's available, feedback's coming in, and no matter what tools or technologies I'm using, we're still getting the necessary feedback to be successful as a team. So that's kind of a kind of that orchestrated pipeline of feedback. And the reason why I thought it was important to show everybody this is because of the next slide. There are initiatives and or use cases that are driven by separate groups to get to that end-to-end kind of orchestrated pipeline that I just spoke about and Amy referenced as well. And interesting enough, um, I kind of we tried to break it down into three areas we tend to see throughout uh, the various heat zones that that Amy just showed you. One is infrastructure and operations. Amy called this INO. So we see projects or initiatives coming down from CIOs, CEOs, other senior executives where the operations staff is driving that initiative. They're ultimately responsible. They get the budget for it, and it's very hot in both financial services and some of the other hot zones. Amy covered. We also see cross-team, cross-project initiatives where it's senior architects, developers, and operations working together. They already have tools in place, but they really want to drive an orchestrated end-to-end -end solution. They're getting tired of the mess of many and they want to consolidate and really have a seamless pipeline, regardless of whether I'm running a task in development, like doing a build, all the way through to me being in operations and needing to make a quick change to provision a server. They want to be able to use a, a platform, a technology that helps them there. And then finally, we see projects or initiatives that are development-driven, uh, CI and CT, that's continuous integration, continuous testing, as well as continuous delivery are very, very popular on the development side of the house senior architects, development leads, QA, those who are sitting on the development cost center, they're doing all kinds of different automation aspects. You even see me talk about QA lab provisioning and test automation once we get into some of the detailed use cases. So these are the initiatives that have been driven, and I had to cover this so that I could try to bring back a map that maps into what Amy shows. So this is a quick flashback. Always, Amy and I have spoke together prior. Amy was about a year ago in February last year. We spoke in London. What's exciting is we were talking about this, but the graphs and the slides weren't together. Now we're coming back a year later, and there's graphs and slides to match because there's data to prove that we were on, on, on the right segment here. So Amy covered some hot zones, and I'm going to focus in on five of these hot zones, particularly where we uh, looked at our data. So that is the high tech, uh, the other manufacturing and pharma, retail and wholesale, the services and financial services, those really hot zones that are hot from 40 to 100 percent. And what we took the liberty to do in reference to what Amy did is kind of build automation initiatives as use cases within DevOps. So let me explain this way. So the first one, 
projects that are infrastructure and operations driven, they have use cases where they're trying to perform deployment automation, meaning that all I care about is I need to do deployments faster. Maybe I'm not really caring at this moment about coordinated releases between teams. I just have one particular team. I need to drive deployment automation faster. I need to get things going a lot quicker. I have packages or artifacts that are coming from development, and I need to get them out into production a lot faster, and I build a deployment pipeline for that. Release management is more coordinated across a, a release stream for teams where we're saying now we want to coordinate a release, a major and a minor. We have a series of activities that crosses multiple projects, multiple teams. We have common and shared libraries. We need to release everything all at once to make sure it all works. And so release management is more team effort, team uh, constituted. And then compliance and audit that Amy mentioned for infrastructure and operations, highly regulated industries, healthcare, FinServe, insurance, they're always driving initiatives where they're trying to create and build out audit packages. So those are some of the hot zones and in infrastructure and operations driven types of initiatives. For cross-team driven initiatives, we see things like DevOps orchestration, where we want to drive end-to-end -end orchestration. We see cloud resource management. So we have this proliferation of cloud, both hybrid, some private, some where it's in the cl public cloud, or like I said, it's a hybrid situation. And we have tools for that, but oftentimes teams are still tussling with making sure that they can see, okay, I don't want to be spinning up a test instance in Amazon being charged for a month and I only used it for a week and a half. So there are initiatives that are spinning up that are really, really getting hot saying help us manage and understand where those resources are and build automation tasks and nightly jobs and schedules to make sure that we're getting the value out of those resources, spinning them down when they're no longer needed. Config management orchestration with proliferation of Chef Puppet. I have not been to an account in the last, I, I can say at least a year and a half, where someone is not either on-site or an expert in Chef Puppet Ansible or Salt Stack. Very, very critical technologies for what we do, both for managing the cloud infrastructure, for giving, giving us the opportunity to provision resources, but oftentimes they're very script-based, and oftentimes uh, companies want to really drive a pipeline where this is all automated versus relying on heavy scripting uh, solutions. So that's the cross-team driven type of technology uh, initiatives. And then finally, the developer team or dev team driven initiatives we see is the traditional uh, continuous delivery, container orchestration, both Docker and Rocket are really, really growing. I would say they're really, really hot. I would imagine, Amy, if we came back, that would be insanely, insanely hot, like two insanelys. Maybe we'll come up with a new color or something, but it would be insanely hot as, as we've gotten to be a lot more uh, conscious of the security holes that Docker has and making it better and it's getting firmed up on, on a regular basis. I, I truly believe we'll start to see Docker in real life production instances on a regular basis, probably 50, 60% of companies starting to move to that. So we see a lot of individuals moving to containers. It's very fast, it's very easy. It starts off in dev teams really spinning them up, but there's orchestration around that and not just having uh, the command line interface to do Docker build or Docker run. And they want some, some control mechanisms in that area. Uh, QA lab provisioning is oftentimes developers are very, very good, very, very uh, astute at being able to set up their own VM, set up their environment, and get going. But sometimes QA can be left a little bit in the dark here, and they're having to set up and get their own provisioning stacks. So QA lab provisioning is starting to pick up as well. And then Amy mentioned IoT, and we also see some embedded aspect that's getting hot for developer team-driven initiatives. So these are the initiatives that we see. And what I wanted to do is kind of give you some examples in the time that we have, and I highlighted those in green where we see, give you some use cases, some specifics around metrics and details, and then we can open it up, uh, Alan, after this for some Q&A. So let's kick this off. Great. So release management. Um, so here's a background example of a leading integrated education provider. They have lots of students uh, as their end user. They were experiencing slow time in the market. Their objective was trying to be able to firm up and put some agile processes around the time we do 
they did development all the way to it being deployed in production. So that's what's called dev test deploy. They really wanted to increase their uh, developer productivity and they had ops teams that were involved as well and they weren't getting the greatest value out of leveraging VMware Lab Manager. And this is no pun or nothing wrong with VM Lab, VMware Lab Manager. They just wanted to get greater visibility and leverage of it using it from an optimal perspective. And so some of the benefits of applying automation for this uh, leading integrated education provider was they grew the team, uh, the dev team from 100 to 250 with very little near zero here infrastructure growth required. They unlocked a lot of productivity gains and again the key is they reduced that configuration time from weeks to hours. So this is just one of those particular use cases drilling down for release automation and being able to have coordinated releases between teams and increasing your time to market. And, and Amy took the liberty to explain that, you know, everyone from a DevOps perspective and looking at the definition, you want to be better at how you respond to your, your consumers, your customer base, whether that's internal customers that we see, meaning that I'm serving an internal business unit or external to me. Uh, both are, are consumers of data and automation, and we want to make sure that they're streamlined. So that's kind of an example of release automation. DevOps orchestration. Um, so again, in, in essence, I'm taking out some of the names. Obviously, we don't uh, want anybody to feel like uh, they, they had a bad situation. Automation just tries to improve upon a process that's already there. So we were working with a company who had significant utilization of IT infrastructure where they wanted to improve that area. And they were spending a lot of time on homegrown scripts. And so that investment starts to wane on the teams a little bit. And they weren't getting the reuse that they really wanted. And most importantly, they had a lot of active users. And that user base was growing. Their goal was to kind of orchestrate an end-to-end -end pipeline where they could gain the ability to get some transformative benefits, like being able to get faster release time as you see, get the utilization of the infrastructure. Again, the key with this DevOps orchestration, the key with some of this ability is being able to leverage what's going on in development and as well as in QA, as well as in operations and in the infrastructure. And one of the quotes I took for them was, Electric Flow, using our product, was has improved our in-to-end -in operations management process for our various internal applications. So it's just one of the quotes for them, just as a, as a background there. Moving on, cloud resource management. I would say this one for me, that this one and the Docker, even though I didn't cover Docker, the cloud resource management, Alan and Amy, and the Docker one is usually the more interesting. And I'll tell you why. So when you start looking at cloud resources, there are so many technologies out there. And the assumption is that everything is covered, that they all do whatever automation you need. And there's still some gaps that teams are finding, even though there are tools in that area. And so sometimes you need to someone to glue these, uh, these automation streams together and put it in a pipeline that's viewable across teams. And so that's where that cloud resource management comes in. There are cloud lifecycle management players. There's lots of players in that space. But there's still a few gaps when it comes to cross-team visibility. So one of the customers we worked with, they had a lot of apps, a lot of projects, developers growing in multiple regions. They, a lot of customers that we, and we have a lot of customers that don't just use VMware, by the way. I think these examples are kind of heavy on VMware. They just happen to be using vCloud Director. They had a lot of dynamically provisioned environments. And by di dynamically, it's basically saying, okay, look, based on load, based on demand, I want you to spin up an environment on demand in the event these use cases or these metrics are not met. And so being able to do that and then also spin them down but collect the results before you spin them down is part of the key. So they were able to reduce uh, from 10 errors per cycle down to zero. They accelerated that build test deploy. We call it internally BTD from three hours to 30 minutes. So that's a rather drastic reduction. And they reduced their environment spin up time, which is part of the key in gray there from seven days to two hours. So they were using technology, they were doing spin up but they wanted to really increase that and take out some of the manual steps and have checkpoints, have uh, you know approvals and things, but they wanted that spin up time to be faster and they were able to achieve it. So one last one, the continuous delivery one, always popular, I just see this being popular, Amy and Alan, for, for a long time to come, is um, being able to really fulfill continuous delivery. And we kind of look at it in two branches. There's the continuous delivery where I click a button 
I just changed some code. I'm using, I don't know, Dr. Java or whatever, Visual Studio, whatever IDE that a developer uh, tends to like. I make a commit in the trunk and off we go. From that point on to it's in production, it's all automated. All the approvals, scraping logs, validating uh, servers are up, making sure metrics are met, making sure I have the right Java commits and everything else that needs to be scraped and validated. It's all done automatically from the time I click the button to the time it's in production. No stoppage. There are some customers looking at that for patches and some other releases. Another spinoff from the traditional CD is kind of the release CD pipeline, which is, well, I'm going to put in weights and gates that say, okay, once you go from dev to test, at test I'm going to put in a manual gate where some dev manager or QA manager has to approve that we've passed 90% of the new functionality test and at least 80% of the results coming back from the load and performance test are of this value. So they put in some specific gates and measures. Someone has to sign off. It's tracked. And then once it signs off or once the person goes in to the change management system that the CAB reviews, and uh, we talked about CAB in, in Amy's session, once that's done, it auto kicks off. So it's not waiting for a human interaction to click a button. It's waiting for some human to say, okay, look, I approve. And then as soon as that's approved, the automation system takes off and it waits. And it's tracking that time so that everyone can be on the same page. And then once we're doing the CAB review and reviewing uh, project status, we can see how things went. So we worked with the customer to do some of this. They were supporting large-scale developers, lots of build test resources in this particular area. And uh, you know they had a lot of changes too, a lot of branches that were going on uh, with regards to their development stream. And their objective was to achieve higher quality, which they did. They wanted accelerated time to market, and most importantly, that, you know, reducing the penalties, the penalties that were avoided as a result of getting that delivery downtime a lot more acceptable was substantial for them. So that was pretty much it for me. I wanted to catch us back up in time there, Alan. I think it would be great Excellent to bring job, back Larry. Amy. Yes, let's have you oh, both you. on. And, and great job, both Amy and Wesley. Uh, we've got some great stuff. So, guys, we've got a few questions in the queue. And, and for those of you out there, uh, you can put them in right now. So we've got a co first question out of the hopper here is for Amy, and it's from Jesse. And, um, Amy, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to adopting DevOps, technology or culture? How do you get started? Well, I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, that's a really common question. In fact, I was on an inquiry call just this morning where I answered the exact same question. So undoubtedly, the biggest obstacle is still cultural. Um, the organizations are usually built with silos, and infrastructure and operations usually have silos within those silos. Um, and so breaking people out of old methodologies of working can be very difficult. And for infrastructure and operations people especially, um, the tools that Wesley was talking about really allow us in infrastructure and operations to move from ordering and manually configuring hardware, for example, to designing and modeling what we think that hardware and supporting software should look like, and then automatically deploying it. So you move to uh, a designing and, and sourcing role rather than a manually ordering and configuring role. Um, and so it's, it's a complete change in role as well. So culturally, definitely, the hardest thing to get over for DevOps, um, you need a sponsor that is high up in the organization enough to allow the team, the DevOps team, to break with old habits. Usually starts grassroots effort very small scale on a single product or server for service, for example. Um, and what you do is we recommend that you do value stream mapping, which is um, a process where you map everything from requirements all the way to deployment. You include time. It's going to pop out where you're spending the most time, where the long poles in your release process is, um, what needs to be automated, maybe where you're having waste. And then you start this continuous improvement process where you're doing, you know, you're adopting automation, you're reducing waste, and you just keep working on that pipeline. Hopefully you're building a technology set um, that, you know, automates this pipeline and then it spreads throughout the company from there. 
great, great answer. Our next question, I think, is a Wesley question, and it's from Bob. It's pretty uh, electric cloud, electric flow specific. Wesley, Bob wants to know, can electric flow pick up builds from Jenkins and leverage your existing chef scripts as part of the overall orchestration, or do we need to replace those tools with electric flow? Like Amy, I, I hear this question probably a hundred times a day. The answer is yes, it can pick up the builds from Jenkins, Team City, Bamboo, some of the old stuff from Hudson, uh, tools like that, and then also leverage the existing framework as a first class citizen from Chef, Puppet, Ansible. And so when I say a first class citizen, we actually integrate in with Chef so that they can do what they do best from a provisioning perspective of resources, be it Wildfly or which is JBoss or, or Oracle or some other or a Tomcat or Apache, something like that. So yes, all those investments made are not replaced by Electroflow. They are leveraged and illuminated by Electroflow through one pipeline so that when necessary, I need to drill down. I can drill down from the, the deployment pipeline sitting inside of Electroflow. And then when necessary, I can go look at a log or pull that log from Chef into Electroflow. So you save time, you save energy. Got it. Um, Wes, looks like the next question is for you as well. And Srini asks, uh, we store all of our security credentials in Active Directory. Can Electroflow connect to AD to drive entitlements and authorizations? Absolutely. And I would say that's mandatory. What I see, uh, Alan and Amy, from an industry perspective is it, it's mandatory. You have to support Active Directory LDAP author, uh, authentication and authorization through users and groups. It becomes a very easy way to save time and ramp up when you're installing a system. Excellent. You know what, Wes, it looks like the next question is also a pretty uh, product specific, so I guess we'll give it to you. Sarah asks, what OS platforms do you support? How long does it take to get the product up and running? So I can point to our docs that's out on the web. So you can go to electrocloud.com and, and there's some links there to get all of our documentation to see what operating systems we support. And from a perspective of getting ramped, um, there, I would say obviously it depends. For the larger systems where you're doing high availability and you have multiple servers, clustering mechanisms, things of that nature, it might take a, you know, a, you know, a week or two to, to get spun up and get the system installed because you've got a lot more hoops to grow through, security uh, protocols, things of that nature. But for someone who's just trying to play, get it up and running, we offer some systems on our website. I would highly recommend going out to the web, and we actually offer a freemium or virtual appliance where you can get spun up in minutes. So it can be anywhere from minutes, Alan and Amy, to you know a week or so, depending on the complexity of the customer. Okay. You know what? I think we got one here for you, Amy. And uh, this is from David. He wants to know, does DevOps meld with mainframe applications? systems of record. Amy? Oh, I'm so glad I got this question. The answer is a resounding, <laughs> absolutely yes. Um, absolutely. The, 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 yeah, exactly. The, the tools around mainframe have really improved. Um, you're able to create APIs in the mainframe. I'm not saying do everything, but the key things that need to change on your mainframe, which you stored in there, uh, you can access via API, open it up via API, and you can o automate it just like you can any system of record, mainframe or sitting on a, a desktop somewhere. It doesn't matter. Um, yes, the, the answer is yes. Don't be afraid. There are some customers out there, if you go searching mainframe and DevOps, um, you probably will find several of the enterprises out there who are already doing it and some good examples of success stories. But don't back off because you've got a mainframe. Um, so like I said, the means. tools and technology have definitely improved in this space. Open those APIs and start automating. And just quick, quick DevOps.com plug. If you search DevOps and mainframes on our site, you'll see a whole bunch of articles on this subject. And uh, mainframes in, in many in many organizations are are leading the way in a lot of DevOps type of uh, functionality. Next question from Tushar: What is config management orchestration and cross team driven initiatives? Please explain this some more. Wes, is this you or an Amy question or both? Amy, you take first stab. 
Okay, so give it to me again. What is what is configuration management orchestration in cross team driven initiatives? Okay. You know what well, that's me, Amy. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll that's not like that. an electric cloud specific. Yeah, so con con so the question was configuration management orchestration. The guy, someone asked the first question, can you take advantage of my existing chef scripts? Right? So in other words, using Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt Stack in the capacity for configuration management is great. They do wonderful things. They give me some asset control there. They allow me to provision instances. But I want to do this in a coordinated fashion for a major release that I'm going to spin out in June of 2015. I need all these action items to occur. That's one of those action items, but there's hundreds of others. And so I want to coordinate all of that and execute that and say go, and then I want to track how things are going. That is configuration management orchestration. It's tying it into the larger release so that you have one end-to-end -end pipeline showing everything. That's the first step. And then there was another part to that question, Alan, if you could repeat that for me. Sure. It's um... – so configuration management orchestration and cross-team driven initiatives, please explain some uh, more. So cross-team driven, so there was a slide where I showed Amy and Alan that said there are three initiatives led that we see. The first one was infrastructure and operations. So these are teams that map to the cost center of infrastructure and operations or IT operations, and they drive their own initiative. They need a solution solution to do A, B, or C, and I put, picked out some hot zones like deployment automation or release automation or compliance and audit, uh, tech, uh, compliance and audit type package creation. So that, that those are IT or infrastructure and operations driven. Cross-team driven is a senior architect or developer lead, uh, maybe a person from INO, they're working together and they put together an RFI and say, we want a solution to do everything lock, stock, and barrel. We need you to go in the end. You need to integrate with our existing tool sets in, in, in this process. And they actually specify the use cases that you need to fulfill. And they put it out to a lot of vendors, not just Electric Cloud. IBM, everyone uh, gets involved. It's more cross-team driven. It's larger, uh, larger stakes here because there's a lot more to prove here. And they've already have technologies and tools in place. And so that's more cross-team driven. So hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. I think it does. Next question. Um, and guys, if you hear thunder in the background, I apologize. Really, we're getting a huge thunderstorm down here in South Florida, it looks like. I just pray the lights stay on. Um, what guidance do you have for blending DevOps with IDLE and ITSM? Amy, I don't know if that's if IDLE and the ITSM is your cup of tea or if you want to. Talk about yes, it, if I'd, not, I'd love to okay, it. go. Um, so, uh, you know, ITIL and ITSM did great things for us. It moved us from chaos into organization. Um, the thing that I would caution you against is don't go to organization into paralysis, um, which you can do if you take it too far. Um, we really recommend folks be pragmatic about their implementations of ITIL. Um, and then how they implement ITIL into ITSM. And really with this DevOps movement, we're moving away from stagnation to being nimble and flexible and fast and lean, um, which are not necessarily against ITIL and ITSM, but not necessarily what those things focused on. And so now we need to move into automating the entire delivery lifecycle and we really need to focus on how to make things lean and fast. So things like a change advisory board, the CAB, um, needs to change. And it needs to take a totally different format. It doesn't mean that we don't need those kind of checks. It just means that they need to be done earlier in the process and automated if possible. So making sure the checks are done right after developers check in code. Um, making sure we have the right quality gates coming out of testing, the right tests inside of testing is really a much better check than people sitting in a room thinking they know what the change is going to do and, and hoping for the best. So I think the continuous delivery pipeline and DevOps really gets us to that next level um, where we're speedy and fast as well as in control. Wes, any anything uh, to add on that or 
man. With, and with the way Amy uh, just stated that, there's nothing I can add but go, Amy. That was okay. perfect. Yep. I mean, I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to put my two cents into that one. You know, in some ways, I don't know if we would have DevOps if we hadn't already had Idle and ITSM come, you know, as a predecessor, right? Because a lot of these things build on each other. And I'm not saying Idle or ITSM was bad, but you take lessons learned as you continue to evolve. And it's the same, I think Agile is the same way too. Can you have DevOps without Agile? And and so I, I think all of these things are interrelated and build upon each other as we continuously try to improve how we how we do business, how we build software, how we release. So I, I I'm not in the camp of you know DevOps good, idle bad kind of thing that you hear sometimes, and I caution people who do say that. Anyway, get off the soapbox. Back to our next question: How do the roles in ops and dev in a large organization change with when DevOps is introduced? Amy, this may be our last question, by the way, but uh, we're going to give it to you first. Okay. Well, in dev, um, you know, they really focus on agile practices. So their role really changes from large user stories, solving large problems, large feature sets, to how do I break this down into smaller and smaller features? And how do I test it appropriately? Um, that actually introduces a lot less risk than the large monolithic releases because we can do very specific tests. So. You know, really developers have to start thinking in smaller and smaller releases. Their role doesn't necessarily change a whole lot, um, but how they get their work done certainly does change. And then for infrastructure and operations, the INO folks, um, like I mentioned earlier, I really think they move from uh, a very administrative role to an engineering role, um, where they are more designers, sourcers, um, than they ever have been before. And it's really because the technology is caught up with us. We have this infrastructure as code um, with configuration management, software-defined networking coming up, software-defined storage coming up on the horizon. And so if we have our continuous delivery pipeline built um, and it's all automated, we can easily take advantage of these new infrastructure as code um, and engineering roles to really try to design and and be proactive with things like capacity. Got it. Guys, we're, we're at the uh, bottom of the hour. I wanted to wrap it up. Before I do, just a quick reminder for folks on, hey, uh, Electric Cloud is running uh, continuous discussions, C9D9 hashtag. And uh, it's an open forum to discuss Agile DevOps continuous delivery. They've got Gene Kim coming on on June 30th and July 14th. And um, invite all of you to, to participate in it. It sounds like it's a lot of fun. Amy, always a pleasure to have you on our webinars. Wesley, I hope this won't be the this is the first, but it won't be the last time you'll be joining us. All of our listeners, Absolutely. thank you. Yep. All of our listeners, thank you for joining. Special, special thanks to Electric Cloud for once again sponsoring today's webinar. I think it was a great one. And uh, until next time, this is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>